Next week is what we call our Constitutional Week. Now, we've been criticized for a couple of things. Why are we spending the state's money to reconvene? The fact is, is that we got out of session and we shut down the expenses of the legislature quicker than has ever happened probably in the last half century. Normally, and anybody who's married to a legislature can tell you this, normally we start in January and we go all the way through Labor Day. We basically shut the, the General Assembly down in the third week of June and saved money every day we were shut down. Then we came back for three days on redistricting. Then we're going to come back for two days on constitutional amendments, and we may come back for two days in November. The fact is we saved a lot of money during that period of time under Speaker Tillis' leadership. The things that are coming up next week, the, the things that have been bottled up in committee that have never been considered are the Defense of Marriage Act, are the giving the powers, th these are things that are on the table, who knows what will come up, giving the powers to the state superintendent of public instruction, who by the way is elected statewide. Anybody who voted in 2008 voted for the superintendent of public instruction. What you may not know is that she was elected statewide and Mark does not have a vote on her own board. The superintendent of public instruction of North Carolina was elected by all of you and does not have a vote on her own board. So that's the second thing. We were hopefully going to do eminent domain, what we probably will not do. Uh, and the fourth uh, thing has to do with limiting the terms of the speaker and the president pro tem because of the situations that we've gotten into in North Carolina where you have the same speaker for a long, long period of time and you know what happens uh, when you have somebody with that much power for that long period of time. Now, I guess most people want to know about the Defense of Marriage Act. One thing wrong with this country, and this goes to your question, sir, one thing wrong with the country is that people apply for these jobs back home by saying one thing, and then when they get to Raleigh or Washington, they do something different. That is a huge problem with this country, regardless of whether you like me or my tone or anything I have to say. It's people who put one thing on their job application, and then when they get to Raleigh or they get to Washington, they act differently. I don't do that. That makes me controversial. When I ran for this seat, when I applied for this job six years ago, I put down that I believe marriage is between a man and a woman, and I would support a constitutional amendment to say that. But what you probably, I want to make sure I clarify very quickly in this conversation. Marriage is all, the marriage between anything other than a man and a woman is already illegal in North Carolina. A Democratic governor, a Democratic Senate passed that bill in 1996 in a matter, from what I've heard, having dinner with some people last year, last week, who were around at that time, in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. In 10 or 15 minutes, they voted in the North Carolina Senate under Democratic leadership on the bill that's called No Same-Sex Marriages. I don't know how much clearer you could be than to vote on a bill called No Same-Sex Marriages. Who voted for that? Beverly Perdue voted for that twice. She voted for it in the Judiciary Committee, and she voted for it at, on the Senate floor. Who else voted for that? Attorney General Roy Cooper voted for it as the chairman of that committee and voted for it on the floor of the Senate. The previous Speaker of the House, Minority Leader Joe Hackney, voted for that bill also, as well as a lot of other people that are in the House. More importantly, over, since that period of time, Many of these people have gone out and campaigned that I'm for marriage between a man and a woman and I'm for a constitutional amendment. But the fact is, and even primary and co-sponsored legislation to say that. Now, what this does next week, and this is the actual bill, and this part really doesn't matter, it just has to do with how you put it on the ballot. It's basically one sentence. That the bill that's going to be considered next week, it'll have some adjustments to it, but it's basically one sentence. But what it's really about is that it's about our willingness as a legislature to say that some decisions of this state are more sensitive and bigger than we are. As a matter of fact, if we had more elected bodies that would admit that they're not the smartest people out there, maybe we'd have a better byproduct. 
But all this bill does is it takes this thing that's currently in the statute book of North Carolina, which looks something like this, no same-sex marriages, passed in 1996, and it gives the people in this room an opportunity to put it in here. The amount of these books and regulations and promulgations and rules and statutes and laws of North Carolina, the amount of these books would overflow a dump truck. And who has voted on all these? Legislators. And who's designed all these rules? People who work for the government. All the things that the people of this state have ever had an opportunity to vote on are the things that are in the palm of my hand, the North Carolina Constitution. So what this bill does, which I'm in favor of, is say that this issue belongs in here from here. Now, I will add to that a couple of more questions. A couple more statements. Number one is that 30 other states have already done this. Now let's relate this back to business and jobs. There's a book that came out last month called Rich States, Poor States. In the book Rich States, Poor States, they measured the financial vitality of the 50 states in the United States. Nine of the top 10 states in the U.S. have a marriage amendment in their constitution. So this whole argument about somehow or another this is going to drive away business is false. The fact is that anybody in this room, including the small business owner sitting here, is in business for one basic reason. He wants to provide or make a product that people want to buy so that he can make a return on his investment and hire some people along the way. That's the main thing they do. The second thing I want to say is that after this gets refined, is that there's nothing in this book that involves private transactions. There are some people in this room who are medically more qualified to make medical decisions than I am. The fact that this gets in the Constitution is not going to restrict anybody's ability to designate anyone else to make a decision on their behalf. It's not going to keep anybody, I could name you as my beneficiary for my state pension plan. You can do it today, you can do it tomorrow, and you can do it after this amendment passes. It's not going to do anything to affect people's ability to designate who they want their beneficiary to be. What it will do is it will cement this issue into the Constitution. Thirty other states have done this. Three or four other states are going to do this, probably in, the, in 2012. And I will just step back before I take questions or comments. And I appreciate, since the fact we have children in the room, I appreciate people keeping being professional about that. And I'll do my best to do the same. But the fact of the matter is, is that all we're doing is we're pushing the power away from us down to the people of the state. And it goes back to what I said seven months ago. People run for these offices saying they're going to do one thing, and then when they get to Raleigh or Washington, they do something different. That's why I'm supporting this. That's why I'm, we're have, that's one of the five re, four reasons we're having a constitutional uh, session next week. And uh, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions that anybody has on that subject for the next 15.